Take a third. We'll, we'll see how. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Uh, how y'all doing? Awake? Coffee kicked in? I'm gonna fall over a chair. Is that all right? Thank you. So, uh, well, looking good to you there. So what we're going to talk about today is data pipelines in the cloud. In this conversation, we're going to talk about the two types of data pipelines that are typically go that are typically used. I'll give you a hint. One is event driven. The other is batch. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the tools that you can use to create a batch pipeline. That's what we call Spring Cloud Task. Then you're going to, we'll talk about the one that creates event pipelines, and that is Spring Cloud Stream. Then we're going to talk about the orchestration. How can we simply create these streams so I don't have to home roll them? Even though stream and task make it incredibly simple to do it, we want to take it to the next level up and offer this orchestration so it's simple. So uh, we're going to start in on that, but first I'm going to introduce Roy. Roy, tell me about yourself. Yeah, my name is Roy Clarkson. Uh, I've been with Spring Team for over six years now. So it's been a fun ride. Um, worked on a variety of projects. I'm currently working on Spring Cloud Services and also on this Dataflow project, which is uh, relatively new for me. So it's pretty exciting. Um, I helped run the uh, Atlanta Spring User Group. So look for us on Meetup. We've been on hiatus for about a year, but we're about to kind of re-kick things off. So look for some Meetups on there. Uh, well, awesome. Um, I'm Glenn Renfro. I'm also local, both Roy and I are local to the Atlanta area. And I am um, work on Spring Cloud Task, which is, again, one of the components that comprises Spring Cloud data flow, but, again, can be used independently. I'm also a contributor committer to Spring Cloud uh, data flow, the Spring Cloud data flow UI, and the all-time favorite for Atlanta, Spring Batch. Who uses Spring Batch? See? Back over there. And there. So... With that, huh? about a third of the room. About a third. So um, the other thing that I also am is I'm also a on the board of ASUG, or sorry, not ASUG, AJUG, but uh, along with Burke and Laura, who also spoken, which means we're also uh, responsible for DevNexus. So um, with that being said, let's go ahead and just do a little bit of um, startup. You you know, take notes, but anything you see on the screen today, outside just the basic demos. Well, actually, the demos are actually up there, too. Go to this repo, and you'll be able to pull down the uh, keynote that we're using here, as well as a PDF of the keynote, and then as well as you'll also see links to Spring Cloud Stream, Task, Dataflow, and also to the sample that I'm going to be using. With that, that before we get started, I want to tell you about a story. I've got, I've got this idea. I want to create a new sporting league. It's going to be called the NFL, it's called the National Foosball League. Not to be confused with that other one. With that, I want to have a grand championship in, let's say, the month of um, February. I think that would be a great time to have our championship. With that, I'm going to pick a network, and they're going to pay me a gob of money to uh, host and be able to show my wonderful uh, program uh, championship. But with that, what I want to also be able to do is I want to gather historical statistics from both research firms as well as the cable providers so that I can find out all, those, all that information that's coming historically. But I would love to be able to capture the information uh, that's coming in from the social media. But I want to do that one live because I want to participate in that social media with all the, uh, with all the people that are both tweeting or Facebooking um, or Snapchatting. I want to capture all that. I want to do so live so I can be able to gather statistics so that I can go ahead and maybe put out a few tweets of our own so that we can encourage the social media chatter. But to do that, I want it, how do I, you know, how can I get that information? So what I want to do is we're going to pick on Twitter. So what I want to do is I want to create an app called Twitter Stream. In Twitter stream, I want to just get all the data from Firehose. So I'm going to pay for access from Twitter to get Firehose. I'm going to get all the data that's coming off of Twitter from the start of our game at 5 p.m. all the way till the uh, post game, all that um, from the last foosball uh, uh, win. Uh, I want to be able to store all that data for historical purposes, right? So in this case, we're just going to put it to a file. It could be HDFS, it could be a relational database, whatever we want to do. In this case, I'm just going to store it to file. Miraculously, we notice that these happen to be Spring Boot apps, right? 
And everybody's like, okay, enough with the boot, Glenn. Keep moving, 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 all right? So, but that's cool, but that's still a history, right? And being a batch, I like that. But I also want to be able to take action. So what I want to do is I want to tap into that feed, and I want to get some real data coming off. So the first thing I want to capture is what languages are being used during the game um, so that I can say, maybe get a kind of a demographic of languages so I know maybe how I should tweet and to be able to facilitate more conversation. Then I want to do the famous hashtag count. I want to know what hashtags are being used during my game. Is, is, is the championship that I have the number one being spoken about? Or is it fairly low? How can I encourage that? What other things are going on that may be being tweeted out about more than my, my given app? So with that, let's get started. So I have coding? It's all carefully scripted. <laughs> so first thing I'm doing is spring up data flow. So data flow is starting up in the lower uh, screen. Don't worry about it. I know it's small text. We just know that I want to show you that it's actually a live demo. And then what I'm going to do is as I'm going to bring up a UI, or not UI tool, but just a CI tool, or CI tool. You can tell I have not had enough coffee today. CLI. CLI. And so this CLI tool allows me to be able to create streams. And we have a wonderful UI. I'll show you that because I did say I worked on the UI project. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and type and create that stream. So the first stream I want to create is what? Just capturing that data and putting it to a file. So I'm going to do a stream, create, and I'm going to call it tweet, dash dash definition, and then I'm going to call it Twitter stream, or actually I'm going to create a source. So my source is what's going to, is like the beginning of my stream. Now you'll see I will use stream and pipelines interchangeably, forgive me, because I live on both sides of the world, so I get to save both. So in this case, I'm going to create one called Twitter stream. It will not be taking off a fire hose because I can't afford it on this phone. I'm, I'm, I'm wired into here, so it'll be a little bit too much money. So in this case, I'm going to be taking off what's called garden hose. You can do that for free. And it basically gives you a sample feed of what's coming off of Twitter. So that way you can kind of play with it and actually do your own practice with it. So in this case, I'm pulling off of Garden Hose. And I'm going to put it to file. But I want to do some configuration here too. I want to tell file where to write the file. And I want to uh, be able to do that right now. So I'm going to go ahead and say file dash dash. And I'm going to say directory. And I'm going to put it in my users. Glenn Renfro. Uh, and then we'll put it in my temp directory, and I'm going to call it, and we'll call it uh, springdays.txt. Okay. And we'll hit return. So I just created that stream. I can actually even do a stream list. But this stream is not active. All I've done is I've created that definition, right? So, and you notice it was a pretty concise, tight uh, uh, DSL. Okay, so we've done that. Now I want to activate it. So what I want to do is I want to do a stream deploy. And I'm going to say tweet. Okay, I hope I got that right. And the one thing that you'll see is I have to, in order to get into Twitter, I have to have my credentials. I don't want y'all to see my credentials, but also at the same time, I don't want them recorded, but nonetheless, I need them. So I have a property file with uh, that information in it. I could have that information set up in my environment. I can have it set up in a properties file. I could even put it on the command line if I wanted to, but I didn't want y'all to see it. So in this case, I'm just using a properties file. Now I'm activating um, my tweet uh, stream. We will wait for it to get started. So with that being said, the one thing that's happening now that I want you to understand is that the first part of this presentation that you see, whoa, hope you're awake, is all running on my local machine. This is a development mode. This is something that you can do locally. This is sub, um, so I'm just doing this to be the first part. Roy is going to actually show you how Spring Cloud Dataflow can push it to Cloud Foundry. Okay, and we'll talk more about the platforms we support. So right now we're getting actually live data from Twitter. Okay, so that's what you're seeing on the console. 
Well, that's cool, but that doesn't help us with our problem, right? We still want to give do the live count. So let's go ahead and do that. So for that, to save time, I'm going to cheat because I have a tendency to fudge finger this. I practiced it three times, and every time I practice it, I always messed up. So I do a copy paste. So with that, you'll see that what we have, and I'm going to just use my mouse to reference it here, is I'm going to create a tap. And you notice I'm tapping on the tweets stream. I want to pick up everything that comes off that Twitter stream, okay? And I want to send it to another app, right? Another boot app called Field Value Counter. And then I want to look for the field name entities hashtag dot text, okay? And then you'll see at the very end, I, I want to store all that information in my Redis uh, the, with the key um, hashtags. And I've deployed it. I mean, I've already pushed it out to the real world. I created the definition and I did a deploy. So let's go back and also do it for the language. And we'll did the same thing. I said, you know, except for I'm doing Twitter stream again. But you'll also see where I'm doing a field value counter. But I'm looking at the field name language. And then I'm storing it as a key in my Redis and the language. So what does that look like? Let's go to our UI. And we can see, let me shrink that down a little bit. We can see that right now for every, we're getting adjustments and showing live data coming in. I have to also warn you, I don't know what's being tweeted right now. So if you see something that's not too nice, it's not my fault. This is actually live, right? Yes, it has happened. So with that being said, let's give you something a little bit more safe. Let's take a look at the language that's most commonly being used. And right now, for whatever reason, the Japan is really being chatty today. So Japanese is the most commonly used language right now, but we also see that English is coming in second place and then all the way down. This is coming in live, okay? So my phone won't catch fire. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and, so I've created the definitions. They're all running, they're all doing their work. We're seeing that we are actually storing data to a file, but we're also capturing that data live in other um, streams. So what I'm going to do to deactivate the tweets is I'm gonna do stream undeploy tweets and then everything goes to a screeching halt. I've basically taken that stream and I said, turn it off, undeploy those apps. So if they were on Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes, it would destroy those instances on the, on the system. Since it's on my local machine, it just terminated the Java run, okay? So we can actually go back and one more example, you'll see that now everything is quiet. But the data is stored in Redis, so it still shows up. So, back to the boring stuff. I'm sorry. So where all this stuff, good stuff come from? Before we go too far down that pipe, so to speak, I'm sorry, I know being funny today. So the one thing that uh, we did cover, what I want to do is before we talk about some of the underlying technology, I want to talk about the two different pipes. We have event-based pipes. That's what you just saw. That's live. It comes into existence when I say activate and it stays in existence until I say terminate, until me or someone else, Roy or you, or we have a timer that turns it off. Because we want, in a game, in our example, I want to start the streaming precisely at five o'clock. I want to terminate it at 10 o'clock, right? So it has a, it has an, it can be unbounded, but we can also have, but we, there is going to be a person or event that will actually deactivate it. And it takes in live data. Um, or can actually go in and maybe pull data from a source. For example, it can pull in data from an FTP. It can pull in data from a directory. It can pull data from a web service. It can, uh, you know, or be event-based like what we just saw here, where it can receive data from IoT devices, right? And just be always receiving that data. The other type we have is called batch. That's more ephemeral. I mean, it does have a set start time. Somebody can activate it or it can be done on a trigger, but it has a fixed end time when it's completed its job, meaning I don't have to go in and terminate it. It's expected, it is expected to start and stop on its own. That stop can be both successful or unsuccessful. Okay, so your Cloud Foundry folks, um, it's a pretty new concept, but if you use like Kubernetes, it's basically a job off of Kubernetes. But for... Um, they, uh, but for uh, Cloud Foundry, the concept of task is now there. 
because in the past, if you had a task um, uh, or a, a, an app, if it failed, it would always restart, right? In this case, um, if an app just ends or even fails, it doesn't get restarted. It has to be done by someone else. So what two projects support these two types of streams? One is Spring Cloud Task Stream. Sorry, Spring Cloud. Spring Cloud Stream, and that handles the event pipeline, right? And then we have Spring Cloud Task that handles the batch pipeline. So let's dig in this just a little bit deeper. So we're going to take a look at our Twitter stream and file again, right? How do these guys communicate, right? How do they how do they chat between each other? So Spring Cloud Stream is a framework that Spring offers. And what it does is it can take your Spring Boot app. It's built using Spring integration. So how many people do Spring integration in here? OK, so there you go. It basically it simplifies the uh, key element where I want to have a microservice be able to communi communicate with other microservices. And I want to do so where, with a minimal amount of code. And what it does is you can just add an annotation and specify the binding that you want that uh, app to have so they can communicate with other apps within uh, my microservice architecture. So before we go too much further down that line, how did we actually communicate between Twitter stream and file? We have what's called a binder, meaning that everything that is published from Twitter stream that gets sent to the file is going to be stored on this binder. And that binder is uh, can be Rabbit, MQ, or it could be Kafka or JMS. So the messages are never lost, and you have several policies that you can set up. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday about Kafka as well as Rabbit, how to handle messages that go between two variables, between two apps. But basically, um, Spring Cloud Stream allow it can do this because it offers an opinionated um, way to allow you to connect at your source again, the beginning of your stream to the sync, which is the end of your stream, or if you want to have processors that enrich your data or filter your data but end within your stream, you can have, again, a source. I may, in one example, is I might have Twitter stream, but I only, they may want to filter out anything that doesn't have specified hashtags I want to see. I can actually put these filters in, and then I can, uh, after those filters, I can add uh, other filters in there to enrich the data, maybe grab data from a, a uh, gem fire and enrich the data it's going through before I actually store it to the file. How does that, what does that look like? So if we look at Spring Cloud Stream, the only thing I effectively have to do is add at enable binding to the top and then specify whether it's a source. Remember at the beginning of my stream, a processor, something that can happen in the middle. And remember I can have, and also I can have more than one processor in a stream. And then lastly, I can also have it as a sync. So basically, it's add enable binding, and then it's source processor sync dot class. And then you see at the bottom, this again, this is just a regular boot app, but in this case, it's going to be using an inbound channel adapter for you folks that are used to spring integration. And I'm going to be the value that I'm writing out to is source output. All this is configurable uh, through properties via Spring Cloud Stream. So I can actually create my own streams without having to go use Spring Cloud Dataflow. I just have to be able to set up the properties upon deployment time to know, you know how to set up those streams. It's actually fairly easy to do. It's just, um, it's just, well, it's not tedious. It's just that you have to do it by hand or set it up at deploy time when you push your uh, apps to either uh, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, or et cetera. So, okay. so Spring Cloud Task allows us to uh, use it to develop run, uh, and run short-lived microservices. So we're talking about ephemeral. You're like, is that really a microservice? Can a microservice actually have a set again and in time? Is a batch job really something that can be a uh, microservice? And the answer is yes. But it has to also play by the microservice rules. And some, so there has to be some kind of features that are built in it. Like, for example, did the app actually start? Did it, did it stop? When it did stop, how did it stop? We need to be able to record that information. When the app did start or terminate, did it let somebody know that it started to terminate? And when it did terminate, did it tell somebody how it terminated? So with that being said, um, Spring Cloud Task simply allows you to add an annotation. 
and you get these features where we'll actually store that information, the start, stop time, and how it ended uh, to a relational database. And we'll actually um, hook into Spring Cloud Stream and you can specify where you want to go through a property where at its, when it terminates it can, or even start, it can emit a message saying, hey, I started, so, and it can emit that some kind of log, if you will, or just go nowhere. But more importantly, when it ends, you can go to an event handler stream, and that stream can say, oh, it ended successfully. Okay, no problems. Oh, it, it failed. Okay, we might need to notify somebody via, via SMS that, hey, bill run failed, for example. And they can then turn, go into the database and tweak it. But better yet, what you'd probably rather have is it actually emit an event to another system that goes in and says, oh, I know how to fix this, and in fact, it goes in and it fixes it. Um, the other thing is with uh, batch, or with this, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, when you talk about batch pipeline, what you're also saying is as soon as bill run ends successfully, I want to go do invoicing right after. But then again, I could also have up there where I don't want to have an emit a message to a stream. I could actually have a fail notification up there as well saying, um, don't go to invoicing, go to um, bill run correction, and then pipe it back into invoicing. Kind of up to you how you want to handle it. We'll actually have a very, very, very brief um, I don't think we'll, we'll have a brief discussion on it later. So to kind of finish up on this Spring Cloud task, you, all you have to do to make a, a Spring Boot app a task is add the add enable task annotation. That's it. So how does Dataflow fit into all this? The Dataflow is a microservicing toolkit for building data integration pipelines, right? So both task, I can take a task and push it to Kubernetes, and I can also push it to data, or sorry, Cloud Foundry, or even run it locally, and it runs fine. I can create a stream of, um, I can create a stream or pipeline of uh, um, stream apps hooked together, and they'll run. But what Dataflow allows you to do is instead of having to, um, you know, uh, push the apps up to your uh, platform, connect them via properties, and then start them, it does this, all this for you. And all you have to do is, first thing you have to do is you have to submit your DSL, where you saw me say stream create um, um, Twitter stream pipe tweet, uh, uh, file. And then that was it. And then this is where Dataflow kicks in. As soon as you're ready to do the uh, deployment, it goes into a repository like Maven, or you can specify another, and pulls down your resources that you need and actually pushes those directly into your cloud. So you don't even have to do that. You just specify when you register your app. Let's say you have your own home mobile app. You just register it and say it's at this Maven coordinate. And that way, Dataflow knows, oh, you want to use this app? OK, fine. I'll push that out to the real world. I just happen to have two uh, apps called Twitter Stream and File already there. Then what we'll do from that point, uh, what Dataflow does, is it binds everything together. So I don't have to worry about doing all that binding, right? I don't have to say, OK, Twitter, send the file right through the properties. It does that automatically for us. And then we also know that um, we can also kind of choose which platform we want to go. We can push it to Cloud Foundry. That's probably the best choice, or is the best choice. But if you're Kubernetes, you push it to Kubernetes. It can push to Yarn or Mesos. Or like we have in our development, I'm using it just locally deploying it to my local machine. Once our apps are up, we can actually monitor the metrics of our app. How many events are we handling per second? And you can actually monitor how our apps are doing. OK, um, let's see, we're doing at 25 minutes. Can we go to 30? OK, so I'm going to do one more quick demo. And this time, what we're going to do is something a little different. So we're going to go back to our dashboard. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to streams. So what I want to do is I want to create a stream right now. We're going to call it SD stream. And it's going to be the, the first stream that typically is, to, is created. It's called TikTok. And I want to have a time that's going to emit an event once a second. And I want it to write it out to a log, which is just going to be a console log. So what I'm going to do, and it's trying to give me too much help, 
Oh, actually, I don't need that. I only want to take drag time here. And these are, you can also, uh, Dataflow comes with, uh, we have a project called Spring Cloud Stream Starters. And Dataflow, uh, there's a simple app import you can do, and you can have all these app starters available to you. And we've offered, you can actually see a bunch that we have here. Um, FTP, Gemfire, JDBC, Sync, Sources, we have several processors. So you can take and grab those and use those as you see fit. And or you can make your own. And then we're going to take and connect those two together. So now I've just created a stream that's going to emit an event once a second. It's going to write that out to a log. And Roy's going to actually show you that and how it looks on Cloud Foundry. I'm going to call it TikTok One since I've already done it before. I'm going to deploy that stream. Okay, I've just created and deployed that stream. I can now go back to the streams and see TikTok One is still in the process of deployment. But I guarantee you, if I go back up here in one more second, we see that it is deployed. And we will cheat and go here to the log. And we see that it's actually emitting those events. And what did it take for me to get that to work? One line of DSL. And well, I had to show you it works, so we'll skip that part. But also from here, I can go to tasks, and I can run and create both what's called composed tasks or, or just regular tasks. Like right here, I have a timestamp task. Um, I could take that task and launch it. I can go to executions, and we can see that that task is in the process of running. And hit refresh, and we see that that timestamp task is just completed. I just ran a guys. I just ran a, a batch job, or a, sorry, a boot app. And all, I, and all I had to do, all I had to hear was declared, right? But I can also do this. Now you'll see AAA is just another version of timestamp. It's just going to print the timestamp, right? BBB does the same. So these are just two timestamp apps. But what's interesting now, these again are tasks. But now I can take and run task A, and if task A is successful, it'll run task B. I can also set this up so I can run task A and have it parallel. I can also set this up so that if task A fails, it'll run task C. And if it's successful, run task B and then terminate. It's kind of up to you how you want to build these up. But then what I can do is say create, and I'll call it AAA, just because that's original. And then we can go back to our definitions. The reason I also did that is because I'll push it to the top. And I can hit launch. And once I launch it, we can actually go in and see that, we can go to task executions. And we see that AAA is the process of running and AAA, what, kicked off the AAA, I wish I was showing a better name, um, task. It's now running the BBB, and it's saying, okay, those two run, but now it's checking to see if that was successful. If those were successful, it registers itself as successful. We can actually go in, and since it was a batch job in the background, we can actually go in and check the step execution to see if it was successful or why it failed. You can actually dig into that level of detail. If you're running a batch job, like a regular spring batch job, you get the same level of detail from here. All right. Um, to also kind of give you one more bit of detail, so we go to tweets, and we can actually look at, actually, that's the, sorry about that. There we go, I chose the wrong one. So here we go, we can actually go in and see that we had our, from our Twitter stream example, we can actually, it actually displays, it gives us a, a visual of what we just created. And then we can also go back to our tasks. We can also go to the details of the task I just created and we can see the, visually what it created. So in closing for my section, I'm sorry Roy, I was just too long here, is what does it take to run Spring Cloud Dataflow? Out the box, you can just, uh, like you just saw, you can bring up Spring Cloud Dataflow, just bring it up and running, and use it right out the gate. 
Okay, that's the first thing. The second, but if you want it to persist those definitions, because right now if I can this, the definition that I created goes away because it just uses an embedded HD database. So I could quickly add it to uh, a, a regular relational database to be able to store my definition. And you can do MySQL, uh, Postgres, Oracle, we support a whole litany of databases. Um, if you're going to be event binding, or sorry, right, event um, uh, uh, pipelines, you want to be able to, you want to have uh, a rabbit and or a Kafka up and running. In this case, I have rabbit running on my local PC. I'm running MySQL on my local PC. And if you're going to be doing analytics, you want to have a uh, Redis up and running. So that's what it takes to bring it up. Roy's going to take it and he's going to show off. He's going to show you how to do everything I just did in one line. And it's disgusting. <laughs> Meaning disgustingly simple. So we're uh, committing a presentation crime by switching laptops. I know. But, uh, it's my fault. We, we, can, we have an excuse. Uh, what Glenn did not show you was all of the stuff he had to set up on his machine to get everything running. So what, what is this? MySQL you've got running locally. You've yes. got Redis running locally. Rabbit or Kafka. Today it's Rabbit. <laughs> And you've got those running in maybe a Docker container or maybe just in process somewhere? Uh, I'm doing both Docker and home roll. So you can imagine that's a, a lot of effort to go through. Um, I don't have all that stuff set up on my machine. And he doesn't have the VPN set up that I need. So there we go. Um, today we're going to talk about how does this relate to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, how many people are using Cloud Foundry, the Pivotal version? Great to see all those hands. Do you know the relationship between the open source Cloud Foundry versus the Pivotal version? So open source is freely available. You can go get it. You can try and run it. Uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, there are plenty of people that do it, um, but it is a big effort. Pivotal likes to package that all up. We make it very easy to deploy. Um, one really big benefit for running the Pivotal version of Cloud Foundry. Um, Pivotal is a sponsor of Spring, and so we have integral knowledge of how Spring projects work and how they deploy on the Cloud Foundry. And so we like to say that Pivotal Cloud Foundry is the best place to run Spring applications. And we continue to, to strive forward with that with uh, things like Spring Cloud Services, which is the project that I'm on, uh, making some of the Spring Cloud, open source Spring Cloud um, projects available on Cloud Foundry and making them easy to use. But today we're going to talk about Dataflow. And to some of the hallmarks of Cloud Foundry, ease of use, security, reliability, scalability, all of those things that Glenn just talked about that he had to set up on his machine, those are things that the platform will handle for you and scale for you and handle the fault tolerance for you. And all of these things are, are huge benefits. Um, so some of you may have heard some rumor about this, or maybe not, but Basically, today we're going to be announcing that we're going to be releasing a Spring Cloud Dataflow tile. All of this open source work that Glenn has been working on, we're packaging it up on a tile that you can just easily deploy in the Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're all very excited about this because it's going to make demos easier, for yes. one thing. <laughs> uh, but certainly for our customers and, and people who want to use Dataflow, they'll be easily able to install this tile and then um, I do need to go ahead and say this. This is a lot of words. <laughs> uh, this all says that what I'm about to show you, I'm talking about pre-release software. Everything may change. Uh, not necessarily likely, but just, yeah, don't hold me accountable for everything that I'm about to show you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about default services. Um, Glenn had a slide up here. He had a, a bunch of different things available for the binder, database, analytics, repo. Um, default services for the tile currently in, a, in its current state are that we support Rabbit, we support MySQL for the database, and Redis for the analytics repo. And you might ask, why, why do we support those three? Well, we've got tiles for those three, so it's logical that those three are our dependencies for the tile. And if you haven't seen the uh, Ops Manager dashboard for Cloud Foundry, then this is just a, a display of the tiles as they're installed in Ops Manager. 
Okay, well, this is the, the crux of my presentation. <laughs> so let's go show you how this works. Um, instead of deploying all of the stuff that Glenn showed you earlier, now all you have to do is the CF create service command. I know. It's, uh, Can everybody see that? Or does it need to be a little bigger? Okay, so I'm creating a data flow app server uh, simply by calling the CF create service command and, and against my uh, Cloud Foundry instance. It's kicked off that that uh, command. Um, see, while it's running, I'm going to show you, talk a little bit more, a couple more slides. It usually takes about a minute for everything to deploy. Um, let's talk about Service Broker. What we've done is we've implemented a Service Broker for Dataflow. And if you're not familiar with the, the uh, model for a Service Broker within Cloud Foundry, anybody can build one of these things. Um, it's simply, uh, in our case, it's simply another Spring Boot application that's deployed to the, the system org in PDATA flow space. Um, a service broker responds to a bunch of different API calls, so get catalog, provision instance, create binding, delete binding, delete instance. Um, standard things that you want to do when you're creating a, a service within a uh, cloud so we're, we're actually using a number of open source projects to do this. Uh, the CF Java Client version 2, which is based on Reactor. And so we're also using Reactor as well. Um, and then the Spring Cloud Cloud Foundry Deployer. I'm not saying that correctly. It's, it's, well, it's the Spring Cloud Deployer Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Yes, that one. <laughs> Transpose two words. OK, uh, let's talk about the architecture a little bit. Um, what we do when we call that CF create service command, we are creating a data flow server instance that's in the pdataflow org. And then in addition with that data flow app server, we're also, also provisioning a MySQL, a Rabbit, and a Redis. Those are the three that I mentioned a minute ago. And then in the user space where you actually ran that create service command, we are provisioning what we call proxy services. And these services proxy to the MySQL, to the Rabbit, or the Red, and the Redis instances that are in the backing, what we're calling the backing org in space, which is the pdataflow org in space. And then all of the apps that are deployed for dataflow are going to be deployed into your user space. And this way, we've got a this way, we've got a nice uh, segregation of the, the backing applications, and we can secure those with different user accounts within Cloud Foundry so that developers can operate within their user space, but you can still deploy and, and have these uh, backing services managed separately. So if I go back over to Cloud Foundry, we can see here, I, this is my user space, Roy Home. I've got eight services. Uh, I, I ran this uh, earlier, so I've got, I now have two data flow services, service instances deployed within my space. One is DS1, which is the one that we just did, and the other one is data flow, which I did yesterday. Um, you can see that all of these are appended with a GUID. That GUID is the service instance ID for the data flow server that we've deployed. Um, this way. So if I do a CS service DF1, um, oh. Okay, anyway. Um, it's DS1. Oh. <laughs> I meant to do DF1 because that would make more sense. Data flow. Um, all right, 
So you can see there's the GUID, and then that's going to match up with uh, what's appended there. Uh, if we go over and look at the pdataflow space, uh, we can see, or excuse me, org, we can see that we now have two spaces. One of them is named with that same GUID. And then inside of that space, we have a data flow server. This is the actual data flow server application that's deployed. And it's also appended with that, that same GUID. And then this is where the, the real backing services are deployed, Redis, MySQL, and Rabbit. And same thing, you see this, this theme. We've appended the GUID everywhere. It's easy to, to trace around and see what's associated with Um, you can go look at the, the system space and, and system, or excuse me, organ space. Uh, system org, look at pdataflow space. This is our service broker. We've got pdataflow service broker. And then there's one MySQL service associated with that that keeps some, some state for the, the service broker. But all the requests for creating new uh, dataflow servers, service instances, go through this application that's running. And that's generally the model that service brokers use. All right. Uh, go back over to the slides. Any questions about that so far? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I started the demo there. Uh, what we can do is, unlike Glenn, I stuck all that uh, command into a shell script so that I don't have to type it all out. Um, what I'm going to do is start the uh, data flow uh, CLI. CLI. <laughs> Thank you, Al. <laughs> Very important. And it's going to attach to one of those data flow instances that we have running. All right. And you can do data flow config info and scroll back up to the top. You can see right there that we're targeting that, uh, that service instance that we just created. And then it's got a lot more information there about that. Um, what we're going to do is create, uh, not have it, where is it? Okay, we're going to create a stream. And do the same TikTok stream that Glenn created earlier, but this time we're going to deploy it to Cloud Foundry. All right, quest has been sent. Um, we can come back over to our Cloud Foundry instance. Okay, there you go. The apps have been deployed to the user space, and they're currently starting up. We're waiting on them to do that. Um, how easy was that? A lot easier. <laughs> A lot easier than yours. But. Okay, so again, these are when you deploy apps through the CLI, it's going to deploy it to that data flow server that's in the backing space. But deploy the applications into the user space and then create all the bindings for you, set up all of the security for you. It's all going to be tied to those app, the app and the backing services there in the uh, P data flow and, and effectively the hidden space back there. Okay, so these are running now. Um, and see those apps? And if you've used Cloud Foundry before, then. Dog. Now you can do. Do uh, tail the logs on an application, and there you can go. You can see it's processing the stream. So, all of that stuff that Glenn showed you, compressed down, made much simpler on Cloud Foundry. Okay. A um, couple more slides. Let's talk about security. So, what, what's one of the reasons that you would want to do this route versus using OSS? I mentioned security earlier when we were talking about Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, it's a big deal, and we spend a lot of time and effort to secure all of the connections between all of the backing services, the backing applications, the spaces, and everything. All of this stuff is a lot of effort that 
Pivotal has gone through to create this tile so that when you deploy these applications, all of this stuff is tied together to the UAA and I, your identity within Cloud Foundry so that you're going to have single sign-on and, and it supports all of the security model within Cloud Foundry itself. Everything is secured using OAuth 2 and then all of the endpoints, again, are, are secured with the permission model from Cloud Foundry. Okay, so you might be saying, why only Rabbit, MySQL, and, and Redis? And I mentioned before that we, that's because we have those tiles on ECF. Um, but obviously, if you're deploying this to production, you might have other services that you want to use. Um, Oracle, for example, or Kafka, which is Flynn's favorite thing in the world. <laughs> uh, so Cloud Foundry offers something called user-provided services. What it lets you do is to create the, the bindings, the configurations, the security stuff for an external third-party service, and then you can set that up within Cloud Foundry, and then it'll attach to your applications. Um, this is something that's in progress, so I can't show that to you today, but uh, just to let you know, we, we understand that a tile has to require this if we're going to be able to go to production with it. Um, so I was just demonstrating that we can take those user-provided services and then replace those with the uh, Binder database and, and let's use that. Uh, another thing, and I don't have a slide for this, is that logs. So developers are going to want to see the logs, and right now we don't have support for being able to uh, combine all of those uh, those logs from the back. Uh, it's another thing that's currently in progress. Um, but rest assured, we're going to have a way for you to be able to view all of the logs from the backend services and to do any debugging and things that you're going to want to be able to do. Um, lastly, uh, another thing. If we go and look at the service broker again. Uh, we have a service broker dashboard. Yay. So the dashboard for the service broker is going to list all of your uh, data flow servers that are deployed. And it's gonna, eventually it's going to contain some more information as well. But right now it's going to have the version and then the data flow servers. And then you'll be able to link to those individual data flow server instances as well. Um, let's see, we've got a couple minutes. So any questions for anybody? Anything you wanted to add, Glenn? Sure. Um, in this case, if you're talking about this thing, what you're going to do is you can create your app. Um, we'll just see it if you can create the source. Like you saw in this demo that I had, you would make it a link on screen now. And then all you're going to do in that from that point is go to this uh, called app register. You specify the name you want to call your app, the name and coordinates, a file or HTTP or you know, whatever the source is going to add. And you tell us where the source process is in. So literally, you can do it through the UI, can do that kind of thing, or you can do it through the CI. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so the uh, on-premise right now, the, the one you saw was local. That is something for development. But what we will be doing, um, the Spring Pack admin is going to actually be using the same interface you just saw, and it's going to and we're going to be wrapping that into the data flow project. So the uh, back admin will begin a um, is going to be the deprecated in light of what you saw here, but that's in process. So it will be soon. I know, I've been, yeah, exactly. Uh, there was a question over here. Yes. Yep, I'm just, I'm just making it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you can configure it. Mm -hmm. No, you can set that up for what you want it to be. That's also a point of proxy. You can 
set up. So what it is, is that what you saw me set up were app properties. Um, so the, the thing that you saw was just out of the box, but you can set up deployment properties for saying what space I want to have these in, and even um, uh, you can set the size, how you want it deployed, the whole nine yards for that. And so yes, you can configure that. It was just so, out of the box. It's like one gig, everything. Neil's question was about the, the memory for the application that's deployed here. The, yeah. We've got it configured for a gigabyte. Yeah, um, but you can configure that. But, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Just repeating. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Other questions before we 